so hard. We're going to do this by looking at four hands that he has played recently. He gets in there. He battles. He's happy while he does it. He crushes the opponents. And it's a lot of fun to watch. And, and, maybe we can learn something along the way. So, what we're going to do is we are going to get right to it. Let's take a look at this hand. But I didn't think you could. Oh, maybe we're not going to take a look at this hand. Online. There we go. Meanwhile, 3-4 suited now for Adamo on the button. He will open it up to 3,000. And All right, so let's take a look at the blinds. Blinds are 500, 1,000. 375K in his stack. 192K in Chris Brewer's stack. About 200 big blinds. Okay? Pretty deep stacked. Just so everybody knows, I mean, right now I these players are quite so deep. The big, the see. blinds are 501 k. <laughs> okay. So Adamo has 375 k. That's nearly 400 big blinds. Are, so a hand like four three suited plays eight? a not a lot nicer Six here okay. when okay. when you're that deep. <laughs> you can um, afford to speculate. You can definitely afford to speculate. All right. So Chris Brewer knows Michael Adamo is in position and can afford to speculate. So what is the play when you have a three betting hand in the small blind? Well, the answer is three bet big. So how much is big? Well, it turns out when you're playing really deep stacked, like 200 big blinds deep, you can make it five times your opponent's raise, six times your opponent's raise, right? Here we see 6.3 times the opponent's raise. And I think that's actually fine because you essentially cut off your opponent's implied odds. Now, that said, your opponent may still decide to call in position with all sorts of suited connected stuff. And that's going to make it very difficult for you to play these spots out of position. But you don't really have any other good option. Because if you call, well, now he just gets to see the flop for free. That said, your hand's a little bit underrepresented, which is nice. But if you uh, re-raise bigger, like let's say 30,000, well, now whenever you do happen to run into aces or kings or ace-king, you end up playing a gigantic pot, and that's not really where you want to be with the queens. You do get the 4-3 to fold, though. <laughs> so anyway... This is a spot where if I was a Damo and I would have raised the 4-3 suited like he did, if I got 3-bet this big, I probably would have folded. But let's see what a Damo does. So, and you'll see also when you're this deep, these yeah, like assault, yeah. oh, out of position 3-bets that, yeah, that yeah, Brewer just implemented time, here. Yeah, on the strength of two queens out Over of the small six so it was a 3x open, so the sizes are all bigger, and this Bro, 19, that's more than six times the amount of the our, our stream name is actually. By the way, let me know if the volume is good on the video. I can't exactly tell on my end. Like exactly a lot the same. meatier than we would that. normally be yeah. accustomed to at shallower depths at this stage in a tournament. <laughs> that's so funny. It's like the same screen. So, name. yeah, and, and normally with four high even suited here um, in a tournament, you would give that up, but... But playing so deep, a, a suited connector um, has a lot more potential because when you do make a hand, you you know you can win hundreds of big blinds as opposed to 40 or 50 or 60. And he Commentary there. Nails it. Um, it is worth noting. I want to make it very clear. I think a lot of people in the chat are already saying Michael, Badam Michael Adamo is known to be unpredictable, crazy, wild. But really, I think he's one of the most studied people in poker, not just from a purely... GTO point of view, but from an, a very exploitative point of view, knowing how to adjust to take advantage of what people generally do incorrectly. And you know what he clearly thinks people do incorrectly? He thinks they fold a little bit too much. And if people fold a little bit too much, even at the high stakes games, then you should be nuts. <laughs> so he calls, we see the flop. Here we go. 10, 10, 5, two spades. Here on the paired two spade board, some of that potential is showing itself as Adamo has picked up a spade draw up against queens and tens and Brewer has followed through for just 10,000, significantly downsized, just a quarter pot. This is a spot where I have to presume Chris Brewer is going to be continuation betting with most of his range using a tiny size, as he does. Nothing, nothing too fancy about this spot here. Now, what would I do in Adamo's shoes? I would have called because... It's a disaster if you raise and then get re-raised. That said, maybe you don't really have to worry about that because we're so deep stacked, right? And also, Adamo definitely has more random 10s in his range than Chris Brewer does because Adamo's going to have, well, all the good suited 10s, right? Maybe down to 10-7 suited or something like that. I mean, who knows? Maybe even wider. So for that reason, I think Adamo can raise pretty comfortably here. And if 
Brewer folds out any anything, it's fine, right? And if he doesn't fold, well, uh, maybe he can get after it on later betting rounds. So I think a lot of people naturally have the tendency here to think, all right, flush draw, in position, getting good odds, don't screw it up, I'm going to call. But maybe there's a better line. The sizing. Yeah, so Adamo's basically always continuing here, but now against so small a bet, his decision is whether or not he calls or raises. So, you know, let's see what Adamo comes up with. He raises 3x to 30k. From a Interesting small raise, right? It goes 10 to 30, but notice how gigantic the pot is. Brewer has to put in 20 to try to win 100. So this bluff does not need to work very often at all to show a profit. And also, obviously, Adamo's going to have some equity whenever he does get called. And the neat thing about this pot is, is that if Adamo did have a 10, he would really like to keep Brewer in the pot, right? So you can get full value from your 10s now because Brewer's going to stick around a decent amount. And you're also going to have really good barreling opportunity with this type of hand because if you bet turn Jam River, it puts Brewer in a miserably bad spot. Bowser is Netscape, says Draft Ganger, our poker coach and coach, has said in his videos that high stakes players, well, high stakes live players and high stakes players in general, I think, are not balanced. They usually under bluff and, importantly, they over fold just to a lesser extent than smaller stakes players. So Adamo really, really, really gets after it. If you had the 10 as Adamo, wouldn't you just call to hide the strength of your hand? No, I would probably raise it up because look, the uh, Brewer bet's so tiny, right? He bet 10 into what, 50? So if you call, pot goes up to 70 with 163K left. Quite often, Brewer's just gonna check turn and that's gonna require you to make really big bets. Also, you have to think, Nathan, not just from the point of view of what would I do with a 10, but what do I want to do with my various draws and with my various junk. Like, I mean, give give Adamo Jack-9 of clubs, Queen Jack of clubs. Um, I know he can't have Queen Jack of clubs, but give him those type of hands. I mean, he definitely wants to consider raising with those, right? So if he wants to raise with those, he needs to raise with some nut hands. If he's trying to be anywhere near balance, which maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Adamo, as he poses a question to Brewer. Do you have anything? And Brewer does have something. Um, it's, I think it's very likely he'll just end up calling this raise. This is a spot where Brewer's real, only real good option, I think, is to call. Uh, when you are out of position, you do want to re-raise way more often than when you're in position because you lack position. But in this spot, Brewer essentially has a bluff catcher, right? Where he's way ahead or way behind. Interestingly enough, he's not actually way ahead this time. He's just kind of ahead. But uh, in that scenario where you lose to all of your opponent's nuts, you typically don't want to re-raise with hands like this because whenever you do re-raise and get all your money in, you're just going to be shown a 10 and you're going to be, well, shown the door or shown the, shown the re-entry line. To see a turn card. Um, Obviously, it would be a disaster to inflate the pot further and face an additional raise from Adamo who does not improve on this 8 of diamonds given that the board is paired and certainly 10 of X is a viable holding for Adamo and every now and again he would balance by playing it quickly. Easy check call on so the turn for Brewer. very likely to check. Oh, we already did check. And now Adamo has to decide whether or not he uh, wants to bluff this or take the free card and try to get there on the river. I got to presume Adamo would want to bluff here. Like, if you do raise the flop, I think this is a spot where you need to bet eh, small on the turn like you would do with a 10. Because you have to realize, if you have a 10 here, you're not so worried about a flush, right? I mean, obviously, Brewer could have a flush draw, but the odds he has the flush draw is kind of low, and the odds he hits the flush is also kind of low. So you're not so worried about that. You're really just concerned about getting full value from and like queens if you have a 10. And whenever you're bluffing, well, you need to play your, your bluffs like the nuts to some extent. So I think it's fine to go for the bluff here. Now, it, Adamo does have to be a little bit careful if Brewer will check shove sometimes with hands like this. And if you do bet too big on the turn, say you bet 70K, then this is a scenario where Brewer then will start shoving, right? So this is a spot where I think the only good bet size is small. Now, maybe Adama wants to check it back and then over jam river, but I think that's a little bit optimistic. I think he'd rather just bet small on the turn and go from there. The video keeps freezing. I keep pausing it. I'm talking about the hand. We're commentating here. We're trying to learn something. Is checking the turn a really bad play? For Adamo, yeah, I think it's probably not great because then it makes it really easy for Brewer just to check River and then call any bet, especially when all the draws mess. Again, you, you, you have to stop thinking about exactly what Adamo wants to do with his exact hand, 
right? You have to think, what does he want to do with his range of hands that would play this way? And right here, he's essentially announced he has either a 10 or some sort of a draw. Draws can be backdoor draws, right? If he did have an 8 with a backdoor draw, like Jack-8 suited, I gotta presume he's not gonna bet anymore. Um, but he would continue betting with Jack-9 and Queen-9. That's probably about it. Maybe he could have 9-7 of clubs. He'd probably want to keep betting with that. So this is a spot where I think he probably needs to bet small. Let's see what he does. Thirty-two makes sense. That way he can easily shove so river for two-thirds about pot. A third pot. So if this is called, it sets up. Um, there'll be about 164k in the pot, and um, Brewer will have 110k back. So it sets up about uh, a two-thirds pot river shove. One thing worth noting here is that if I was in Brewer's shoes, I would already have kind of resolved in my mind I'm check calling down on a lot of rivers. Probably all rivers besides a spade. It sucks, but if you know Adamo overbluffs, you in turn must do what? If you know your opponent overbluffs, they've announced it with all of their play for the last X number of years. <laughs> How should you adjust? The answer is you check and then you call and then you check and then you call and then you check and then you call whether Adamo makes it or if he decides to continue his bluff. Sometimes they get you. I really can't see Brewer giving up at this point with two queens. It's just much too strong a hand. And uh, so now we're going to see a river. Brewer does call. And that Ugh. river is an ace. Adamo has no showdown value whatsoever at this point. Now faces another check from Brewer. And oftentimes when you have no showdown value, you do tend to skew toward ambitions all right so let's he's obviously going to skew towards ambitions here i think that's the only option that makes any sense whatsoever because we have to presume brewer would fold out ace queen and ace jack on the turn and maybe even ace king on the turn if if he didn't fold if he didn't fold them on the flop right so we have to presume brewer doesn't have a whole lot of ace x unless it's exactly ace x of spades and a lot of the nice spades to bluff with before the flop are going to be ace five ace four ace three and ace two which are super blocked right so this is a scenario where uh, Adamo is not so worried about Brewer having the ace, which means he probably has an overpair or pocket nines or something like that. So this is a spot where the question becomes, will Brewer fold out those hands to a river jam? I think the answer is probably, but maybe not. I mean, this is a spot where now Brewer must ask, what, do, what, do it, what does Adamo's draws look like? The draws probably aren't going to be ace high draws, right? Because the ace high draws are going to just call the flop bet, I would think. Again, I don't know. I mean, typically people raise with their lower showdown value draws on the flop, like the four high, and not the ace high they can call, right? But maybe Adamo raises everything. And in that case, obviously, he could easily have the ace x of spades. All the ace x of spades are in Adamo's range if that's the case. But if he does not raise the flop with a lot of his ace x of spades, which I kind of presume he doesn't, then this ace is actually a brick, right? Because Adamo should have almost no aces. It's not like he's just going to raise the flop with ace nine of clubs and then blast off with it right and if he did have the ace nine of clubs he may not even value better on the river so i think this is a spot where the ace is kind of kind of a blank even though it you know normally the ace is a really scary card i think in this is that spot is essentially a blank of winning the pot easy all in here it's pretty likely he's gonna bluff here given that he decided to bet the turn and the ace is that obviously he could just be running into a 10 though right i mean that's the problem here is he could just be against a 10 and if he's against a 10 he's clearly dead this is one of these spots where I think folding is very standard against the general player pool when it when and if Adamo shoves, but against people who will find all the logical bluffs and maybe even more, I think you just got to pay it off. It's actually a hand at this Here point that sitting down. Brewer isn't Black super Black likely Black. to have an ace after calling a raise and the bet out of position, mm -hmm. um, unless it was maybe the not flush draw. And, and yeah, just Adamo has zero showdown, so he's probably going to make Brewer make a decision for all of that 111k and that tile that he put out there was not a bet that was a time bank being utilized as adamo mulls over his options ace x suited in spades especially given the brewer is unblocking spades would certainly be an option here would it not oh yes i i believe if adamo hit the ace he he would value bet aces and tens yeah. oh and he is piling it in there and the nice thing about 
knowing or thinking that the opponent would well the, the nice thing for Adamo is if he knows he did have like you know ace x of spades or ace x of clubs that if he did get there he would also value bet that allows him to bluff with a lot more of his bluffing combinations right the problem though is that whenever you value bet those hands sometimes they lose because uh don't forget brewer could just have a 10 don't forget don't forget brewer could also have a 10 so this is a spot where you have to be a little bit careful going for too thin of value because you will run into it against a 10 sometimes so it's kind of a kind of a dicey spot there to value bet a, an ace Especially a bad ace, because then, like, say you have ace-x of clubs, Brewer could just have ace-x of spades, and it's probably going to be a better one. So, definitely a weird spot where you have to be a little bit careful value betting these hands. Brewer looks miserable. Indeed he does. Adamo shoves. I'm going to go ahead and spoil this for you. I don't know how long Brewer takes, but he's going to fold. And I think it's an unfortunate spot, that's for sure. We're not going to sit here and watch a man agonize for the next uh, X number of time. We don't have time for that today. We're trying to get the most value here. Not the most entertainment. If you want entertainment, go watch somebody else. This is a spot where I think Adamo played his hand very, very well. I would have not played the hand this way. What would I have done? I would have folded preflop to the initial three bet. I would have probably just called the raise, although raising's reasonable. If I did raise the flop, though, I think you just have to blast it off. Um, so maybe a takeaway from this is just take the aggressive line, right? I mean, like you see the, these aggressive lines. They're obviously options. It's not like any play Adamo did here was ridiculous. But he essentially takes all of these aggressive options in a lot of spots more than everyone else. A lot of people in these scenarios will take the passive option of, let's say, just call the flop, like what I probably would have done. And that results in you not going broke as often in tournaments. And to be fair, it will result in more min caches. But that's not how you win money in poker. You win money in poker by getting a hold of all the chips, especially in high stakes games against very good players. I think there's way more merit in kind of hanging around and surviving against very weak players because they're just going to make blunders in the future by, you know, just like giving you all their money randomly. But good players don't do that. You don't get gifts, right? You have to you have to steal the gifts. And this is a scenario where, I mean, Adamo's just showing that even in the high six games, you can get in there and you can uh, steal the gifts. Let's see what all of you are saying in the chat here. Is all in the only correct move here because a smaller size Brewer would likely call? Well, no, essentially, whenever you're in a scenario where your range is mostly garbage and nuts, you want to use a big size. That allows you to use as many bluffs as possible in your bluffing range. We have a tournament masterclass, by the way. We have, we have a sale going on. You can check it out at pokercoaching.com slash TMC. And in this tournament masterclass, I teach you how to play every stage of the tournament and lots of scenarios like exactly that. That you just mentioned. Should we maybe make a smaller bet on the river? The answer is definitely not. We have an entire section on how to play the river in scenarios very much like this. So if you think any other play on the river besides all in is reasonable at all, please, please, please check out pokercoaching.com slash TMC. All right. Let's see what else you we were saying. Doesn't Adamo know that Brewer isn't holding a 10 by his timing tells? No, no. No, Brewer's not a fish. Come on, everybody. Saying that good players have absurd timing tells is just absolutely ridiculous. Uh, no, he does not have timing tells. I, I can promise you Brewer looks Brewer looks like that pretty much all the time when he's playing. All right, let's take a look at another Adamo hand. Another one of our yeah. unknowns. I want to preface this by these guys are just like having a nice chat and laughing. And then uh, here we go. <laughs> I think he was saying you ought to... Like Come on, Internet. Uh, Don't do it to me. It's not a bad strategy. Yeah. Tap the guy in your left. All right. 12,500 playing 300, or 374 deep. So also, again, pretty deep stacked, right? Uh, you're going to make that guy a little, <laughs> little more happy with you than, than most. Right. Keep those three bets at bay. Wrong slide. Sorry, everybody. Five suited for Adamo. I think 15 minutes before Shoots the it up. Is when they start when we have... Panikov's here on the hijack. Good, strong, loose, aggressive player. I played with him just the other day. He was a lot of fun. Gets in there and battles. If Queen Jack suited for Panikov's. It doesn't really open, but they can't, won't serve it to you. No, because it's from, not from here. It's from like... This hand really likes calling in general. Unless you don't want to have a calling range from the hijack, you may want to three bet everything. But definitely a hand that likes to call. Decides to flat. Nine, six suited. This is a spot where, uh, for Dvoris, on the button, if your opponents were, like, bad and weak, you may splash around with a hand like 9-6 suited or 9-7 suited, but against good players, you can't justify that. It's for Dvoris. The Chinese menu here. 
I just ordered. I, I assume Paul just brought his chef and he opened up a kitchen. The the Chinese menu here. They said. No, I'm serious. Yeah, I mean. If he did it inside. That Queen Jack offsuit fold in the small blind by Greenwood was also a spot that maybe you can play against really bad players, but not against good players. Pocket Ace has to call, though. Yeah. yeah. Like, not like in the hotel that's part of this venue, too. Two black eights for I, uh, I Oral out of the big blind. Like As he joins the party. Is anybody staying? Is anybody, do you know anyone who's staying in the Ace, hotel here? 10, yeah, 7, two overs, two the eights. All right, do you all know how to play multi-way pots? They're covered a little bit in the Tournament Masterclass, I think. Also, we have an advanced Tournament Masterclass coming out at the end of the year where we're going to cover multi-way pots a lot. One thing that you will see in multi-way pots is that when you are not the player in position, you must check a lot. And when you are going to bet, usually you want to be betting very polarized, meaning you want to be betting with your best hands and your decent draws when you are out of position. Okay? So... This is a spot where Adamo's hand is pretty good. Top pair is pretty good. But whenever we are out of position, you need to check all of your non-premium hands, like this ace five. Very, very common spot. A lot of people screw up. They just bet because they think they have the best hand and they want protection and all that. But from a GTO point of view, you need to check. Let's see if Adamo checks. It's not exactly the board texture Coral was looking we are not for. Adama with top pair, backdoor no. hearts. Were, were they just out of the room, or you wanted to be at the Adama venue? Yeah. They just yeah, started well, hammering over my head. Perfect timing. Oh, you wanted to be at the venue? Yeah. yeah. Everyone? Uh, I was going to do that, too, and then I trying to listen like, to read some, some of the reviews tips. of the hotel, and they were saying that <laughs> it's hot, and it's he does check. the window, it's loud. Now, should Panikovs bet the queen jack of diamonds? Well, in position, you get to bet a little bit more linearly to some extent um, because you know, you're, you're in position. But you do still want to be betting polarized for the most part. So is Queen Jack of Diamonds a reasonable draw to bet on the flop? The answer is yes. But you, again, want to make sure you are using small sizes, something like 6,000 in this scenario. Like These choices. are the two things I can't have. Instead of C-betting with top pair. What's wrong with air conditioning? 13. Apparently, well... 13! I ran this hand through Munker Solver before we started, and Munker Solver definitely recommends a small bet size here. Panikovs, hello! Small bet's probably better. So, anyway, he bets 13, fine. People were saying it doesn't, like, go low enough. Mm. I mean, do you with the plan, he has. Pocket 8's going to the muck at 88 miles an hour. Got the best hand, and he's got his opponent betting a gut shot you, you in the back door the flush draw, so I don't believe he's going to be playing this as a check bit, fold, but, uh, so see if he I mean, just was check really calls. I mean, it's also not, not a great kicker, right? It makes like sense. Just kind of pot world, control, right? maybe yeah, get some worse hands to so bet. Nice. Easy call here with the ace, five suited. And notice how Adamo's taking his time. It's not like he's like, oh yeah, haha, gotcha, I call. He's taking his time, because if he did have a hand like kings, or queens, or jacks, or jack ten, he would love to be able to call one bet here and then have it checked down, right? Um, and to help protect in the spots that you are going to check and then fold on later betting round, you want to also make sure you have some hands that can easily check and then call down, and that's going to be a lot of these bad top pairs. If one of the, like, if it's not the best hotel I've stayed at, it's like one of the, like, top three or something. It's almost a guy, though, if you try to predict or what he's going to do at all times. He can world. definitely throw some curveballs yeah, at you. It's very, dangerous like, to, to try to be what guessing he, what he's doing. He oh, what a beautiful card for him on the turn. As he has picked up the nut flush draw to I go with like, top pair like, and, and has like, decided to like check once seasons, more. Obviously. Probably no leads here. Uh, you typically want to lead when you're out of position into the flop aggressor when the turn is really good for your range. And this is only good if Adamo has a lot of 9-8s, but you got to presume he bets a lot of his 9-8s, right? So this turn is essentially an irrelevant turn and if anything it may help panicos because he could maybe have nine eight suited so this is a spot where adamo does not get to lead now should panikovs keep betting probably not uh, in this scenario he blocks adamo from having queens and jacks which means he's more likely to have kings or an ace or a 10 and none of those are going to fold to a turn bet maybe kings does but ace x and 10 x will not fold to a turn bet you may ask why would kings maybe fold but not a 10 because kings are better than a 10. But 10s have five outs to improve, whereas kings only have two, for the most part. So this is a spot where you can probably stick around with the 10s and the aces and then fold everything else. 
Panikov's so I, I I don't think this is a mandatory bluff, but like if you told me Panikov's wanted to bet the turn and then blast the river, I wouldn't hate it because I mean you need to find some bluffs. You probably want to keep bluffing though when you have hearts. Like our hearts are pretty obvious to bluff. Um, if you had some an open ended somehow, you probably would bluff, but you don't you not you don't have any of those, so you probably just want to bluff all of your hearts, and that's probably going to be plenty. Although maybe maybe you need to bluff some some hands like this queen jack, could be fine. Unimproved here. Yeah, and Panikovs some, has you know, a gut shot like... still. He's not going to get his backdoor equity coming home there. And as the you see, there is only 93% I mean, chance so for a Dama. That means there's three outs, like, not four, know, because that king of hearts would be problematic, like, putting a straight and a flush and on the board yeah. So for the opponents. And he is going to slow down. Check, check. Fine and reasonable. Rivers of three. All right. Adamo has two options. Well, actually, three options. He has to ask, how does he want to structure his river betting range in this scenario? The best GTO players, and if you look at the GTO solver, will usually have three bet sizes on the river. Three. They'll have a big bet size, mainly used for very good hands and bluffs. Then they'll have a medium bet size, used for decently strong but non-premium hands. That's going to be stuff like ace, jack, stuff like that. And then it'll have a tiny bet size, used with hands like a 10 or pocket kings, or a bad ace. Maybe bad ace can fit into the medium bet size. I'm not sure. There's some line there where, like, a 10 is almost certainly a tiny bet. Um, kings is very likely a tiny bet. Ace 2 is maybe a tiny bet. Maybe ace 5 is a medium bet. It's usually how you want to go about structuring your range. Again, we discussed this thoroughly in the tournament master class. Let's see what Adamo does. But the rate for the Mandarin is, like, really high, isn't it? Like, and 800. And, and by the way, you include bluffs in all those ranges, just very few bluffs in the tiny range and a lot of bluffs in the big range. Or it does have the best hand go to a yeah. river. Nice. Five. Three of spades. Doesn't you would also mix in some super nuts into the tiny bet range as well. That way, your opponents can't just raise you whenever they feel like it. With the, with the trident. With the trident. But if you five. tried booking. No, no, I mean, like, if you just Outside, went online. I saw, like, 1,100. Yeah. 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 And what is the trident rate? Five. Five hundred? Giving it some thought, giving it some thought. Oh, so they need it. So Adamo is just uh, like not debating the here. Series, right? Is it good enough to value bet? Do I just check? Yeah, yeah, let my opponent really maybe bluff, but as he checks the turn, maybe. Maybe Pocket Kings wants to check and call now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe Kings and Tens want to check in and then call. I don't know. This is one of these spots where, again, I am not the most studied player in the world. To be fair, probably no one studied this exact spot in this weird multi way scenario, right? Which is why you got to work hard at poker so that you can kind of extrapolate to. Lots of spots you're likely to encounter. Let's see what Adamo does. He's just checking back and, and decides to okay. go for a very small bet. He does go for the tiny bet, which, you know, is is reasonable, right? It's either a, it's either a tiny bet or a medium bet. I can tell you that for sure. Anyway, I'm going to presume Adamo is right. He goes for the tiny bet. Queen Jack of Diamonds has two options. It can fold or it can raise. Probably do whatever you want. You probably don't want to have hearts here to raise. Whenever you raise in this scenario, you don't want your opponent to have... Oh, wait, let me think about this. If you have hearts in your hand, it makes it less likely they have hearts in their hand, which means it's more likely they have a value hand, right? But if he does have hearts, it makes it more likely he has a thin value hand that may fold to a raise. I don't know. I, I guess you'd rather, you'd rather not have hearts here because you want, you want Adamo to have busted hearts, right? You want him to have hearts that will auto-fold. So yeah, you don't want to have hearts. Much. So if Panikov's had hearts here, he would fold, be more inclined to fold. And if he had not hearts, he'd be more inclined to raise. 48,000. This is almost insulting, but queen high is queen oh, high yeah, at the end of the day. Get here early, right? And again, a or lot of respect, did. I'm oh, no, sure, amongst the players and, and knowing too, I'm sure Adamo's familiar with Panikov's so and his ability, right? but it's not fun, right? When you have nothing and a player throws yeah. a blind, it's, it's kind of that, like, it really is. is. <laughs> Honestly, if you're, you're right. It's almost <laughs> the word disrespect yeah. comes to mind because yeah. it's just like, and he is going to get... But they got a good deal. Is that a call? Was that a, no, oh, a race? No, a race. And this wow. is in part why we do this, Jeff, because we can induce from time to time. And Panikov's 5Xing to 25,000. No pagers going Okay. Raise it up. I have no problem with this. Back over to Adamo. What do we do now? I mean, look, in this scenario, I would have just found a call and not worried about it. I think this is definitely a hand that is good enough to bet and then call. But that's not what Adamo does. No, uh, it's, it's, you're exactly right. And there's one of the reasons. But days. at the same token, this is not one of those where it is kind of like a block He's not nutted. Yeah, he's not like trying to necessarily <laughs> induce. But um, ultimately, 
I think he's gonna have to pay it off as it stands, like, but like, I, I mean, I'm sorry, not pay it off. Pick it off, off is pick more it off. Yeah, that's the wrong word. Um, but then again, it is a it is a nice it's a chunky raise there. He's he's saying I got you know I have something, but to check back the turn and then go for that raise on the river that is there's some levels going. One thing worth noting here is that Adamo's getting really good odds, right? He has to put in five. I'm sorry, twenty to win a hundred. Anytime you have to put in twenty to win a hundred, you can't go around folding the top pair. On here, no and doubt. But what exactly is Ponikov's looking that, to represent that's what as played? That's flatting pre. Right. It's worth noting. What is he looking to represent? Let's, let's sit here and think about this. He's essentially saying I have a range containing, actually, kind of a similar range to what Adamo had. Right. He has some super nuts, a lot of thin value hands like Ace Jack, Ace Nine, Ace Eight, stuff like that. Maybe some two pairs, and then a few bluffs. He actually happens to have one of the bluffs. I can tell you all, Panikovs enjoys a good bluff, so he may be over bluffing himself. Um, so if that's the case, how does Adamo do against that range? Take a second and think about this. How does Adamo do against a range of nuts, decent ace X and better, and a few bluffs? Well, actually not that good, right? He actually loses a lot of the time to the decent ace X. So if that's the case, maybe he shouldn't call. Firing on the flop, checking back on the turn, and now suddenly raising the river after the three of spades rolls right. off. What, would what you makes check? sense? What hand would you check on the turn for value? And now, does you hit ace three suited and you hit the river like that you're checking back? Uh, that's like set of three somehow. You bet the flop and then check back turn and hit your, your and hand. And get a look at that racing pulse there on Ponikovs. Make no mistake, Adamo taking all of this time is absolutely paying attention to every aspect of this situation, including any of the physical tells he might be able to get off of Ponikovs. That said, it's not a given that we've right. correlated it right. to him being right. light. Some people have the nuts yeah. and they do that. Yeah, you're on the bright lights, you're on camera. Oh my goodness. I mean, this wow. is just insane. That, I mean, so let's think about this. Adamo rips it in for a load. The pot was, and I rewind five seconds. Is that a possibility? I don't know how to rewind five seconds. Can I just press like backwards? How big was the pot? Pot was 78K. He rips it in for uh, not all that much, about a pot size raise. He decides to go for it. Now, if you think about the range, we just gave Panikovs, decent ace X, nuts, and draws. If he has a draw, you don't care. You win anyway. If he has ace X and you jam, you think he's really going to call it off here with the ace X? Given I just told all of you Adamo's range to tiny bet the river includes nuts, Thin value hands and garbage, which means when he jams it, he is jamming it with the nuts, obviously, and relevant blockers, right? And then, um, what? So, okay, if that's the case, what should Panikovs do? Well, the answer is he should fold a lot of his ace X, right? Because obviously, all the, the nuts are going to shove, right? Even though there's not a whole lot of nuts, when they when Adama does have the nuts, he's going to shove it. So he needs to find some bluffs. What are the best bluffs to shove in this scenario? Well, you probably want to block two pair. How do you block two pair? You probably want to have an ace. Maybe you want to have like a 10. A 10 could be a pretty good bluff hand too. Maybe you want to have like 10-9. You know, 10-9 might be the best bluffing hand. Check call the flop with 10-9. Check, check, turn. Men bet river. Get jammed. Get raised. Rip it in with 10-9. I think it's probably pretty good actually. That way you block the ace 10 and pocket 10s, which are really likely. But you don't always have the perfect 10-9 suited. There's only three of those, so you got to find something else. Maybe Jack-10 is a good one, too. 10-8 suited, that'd be a good one, too. I think those make a whole lot of sense to jam. But Adamo maybe overdoes it a bit. <laughs> he rips it in with the ace-5, and it makes a lot of sense that whenever you do shove here, you're going to get your opponent to fold out the ace-x. Now, the problem with the ace-5 is that you block ace-x, right? So if, if you think your opponent's range is mostly um, ace X, but you block the ace X, well, that's not so good. You'd rather not block the ace X if, if you think your opponent will fold ace X to a shove. And I have to presume Panikov is going to fold out most of his ace X to a shove in the spot, right? So this is a scenario where I think Adama is probably over bluffing, but again, maybe it's just good, right? Like if you are behind your opponent's range, you have any sort of relevant blocker, Maybe it's fine just to go for it. Maybe it's fine to go for it.
10-9 would be a better bluff. I literally just announced that 10-9 would be a better bluff. Any hand with a 9 or an 8 is probably going to be a better bluff, I think. And you also want to block the two-pair slash sets. But, but, you don't always get to have those, especially as played, right? So, interesting spot where Adamo, again, takes a spot that's probably not a spot to actually go for it, but a spot where you could go for it, and he just does it, right? And this time, obviously, he had the best hand. But quite often, whenever Panikoff takes this line, he's going to have ace-x, and you're going to make ace-x ace fold with this shove. Was this a value bet? No, it's definitely not a value bet. That was definitely a bluff. Because, well, well, sugar. I need to... If, if it was a value bet, it means you think the opponent's going to call with pocket jacks? No, that'd be ridiculous. Come on. Be more the sugar extra for calories. you. Yeah. Right. This is loud, right? Dama opens with deuces. Peters, the oh so pretty Jack 10 suit in. Some people don't even raise twos, by the way. If you look at a lot of the GTO charts, they don't recommend raising twos in a lot of spots. But again, if you think your opponents are not going to three bet enough, you think they're not going to call enough, you think they're not going to apply enough post flop aggression, then you should raise a little bit wider than the GTO charts recommend. Um, this is day two of a tournament. I don't think this is the final table, so it's. I'm sure there are some payout applications, but not a ton. And we must be playing 12K big blind, which means Adamo has 40 big blinds. So we're still like reasonably deep stacked. So fine, here we go. Peter's going to call this the majority of the time. This is kind of like that queen jack of diamonds. You could three bet it, but I usually call. See the screen behind him. 13 players are left. Six spots are paid. We play 13 are left, six paid. So that sounds like we're kind of near the money, but we're not near the money. It's going to take forever. Down to a final table today. That's 500. Four nine, right. also a player who Snatch gets after it a bit. From that said, I'd probably just call here. Green chips worth 1k. Blues 5,000 apiece. The brown chips are 25k. Ollie will join the fun. What did I do? <laughs> Ace Jack 10. All right. Take a second to think about what we just talked about multi way pots. And multi way pots, you want to be betting with what? You want to be betting with your nut hands and some draws. Does Adamo actually have a lot of draws here? Take a second, think about it. He raised from, I think, high jack seat or something like that, or low jack seat. So, kind of early ish position. This is a spot where Adamo. If you think about it, doesn't really have a ton of draws. He has some King X suited, but notice not King Jack and King 10. So maybe like King 7 suited and better, right? Does he have Queen 9 suited? Probably. Queen 8 suited? Probably not, but maybe. Can't have Jack X, can't have 10 X. Maybe he has like 9 8, 8 7, maybe 9 7, maybe 7 6. Maybe, maybe not. So if you think about it, he really doesn't have a ton of draws. Notice Ace X is not really a draw here. Ace X of Hearts is not really a draw. So whenever you completely lack draws, what should you do? What should you do? If you've studied the tournament masterclass at pokercoaching.com, you would know the Pio Solver in these scenarios, when you lack draws, usually uses whatever gut shots you have and also under pairs, usually the worst ones. Ali flops a pair of aces, Peters with two pair. Let's see if he does it. <laughs> Everyone in chat's yelling check. But they haven't studied Determined Masterclass, apparently. Wet texture. Here he goes. Adamo he studied does it. Not care. Going to go for it. Two deuces. Going to represent that range, that opening range that he should possess. Now, why... Okay, so look. Why would you want to be bluffing with twos? The answer is, is that... You don't really have any other bluffs. You have almost no bluffs in the spot. You have like some king X. You have some king X, right? And maybe you have some, have some queen X, but not a lot. So 
you got to find some bluffs. I'm telling you, if you look at the solver, solver really enjoys using small pairs to bluff. Not all the time, but some portion of the time. So here he goes. He does it. Even if you have bottom two, as Peters has right here, you're, you're not exactly in love with the hand. As Brent Hanks here says, bottom two pair is not even the nuts because you could easily be against the super nuts. You're clearly never folding. And Ali, just like that, boom, folds the ace. Just not even a... Note there, um, Ali, I'm starting to make also a player who's uh, studied quite a bit. He snap folds the ace of nine. How in the world do you snap fold the ace of nine in this spot? Some people think, wow, how do you fold ace of nine getting really good odds? Well, the answer is, is that when it goes bet and call multi-way on this board against under the gun and a cutoff or hijack call or whatever it is, your ace of nine is in bad shape. Now, in this spot, he actually wasn't in god-awful shape. But just a fold. Just a fold. Casual, top pair, no kicker fold. Don't don't get married to your hand in that scenario. Question, yeah. yeah. Top pair in the muck. Which would have been the winner. Oh, boy. A little easier for us when we can see all of the cards. All right, find some bluffs, everybody. What should Adamo bluff now? I don't know if this spot's actually covered in the tournament masterclass because this, this is a weird one. But in this scenario, because I've studied these spots... You actually don't want to bluff with flush draws. Would you believe that? You actually don't really want to be betting with flush draws here. And you don't really want to be betting with straight draws. Why? Because whenever you hit, sometimes you're still dead as can be. So you would rather bluff with hands that actually have outs to beat the logical hands you're against. And if you spike a two on the river here, I know there's not a whole lot of twos available, but if you spike a two on the river here, you almost always have the best hand you can play for all the money. And it's very different than if you have like king eight suited or something and you spike a queen, you can't really play for all the money, right? Because you could easily be against a full house because Peters could obviously have all the full houses here. So this is one of these very odd scenarios where you'd rather not have the very logical draws like flush draws because when you spike a flush draw on the river, you can still be against the boats and still lose. Now, you may say, but if you make a full house, you can still lose with pocket twos. You can still be against ace jack. Yeah, but there's just fewer of those, right? Fewer of those available than when you have like king x and you spike a nine or an eight or seven or whatever on the river. Like here, Adamo knows on the river if he has a very good hand or not. So this is a scenario where I think the underpairs keep bluffing more than the logical flush draws slash straight draws. Peter's two pair counterfeited. Oh my oh, goodness. Jack. I can't. <laughs> Adama, what? Also, this is a spot where Winnie Betsy's can get a lot of draws to fold, and draws all have a load of equity, right? Also, if Peters did have a hand like Queen Jack, Queen 10, something like that, he's probably just going to fold it. It's an annoying spot, but I mean, same scenario, right? You could easily be in very, very bad shape. What runs through his brain? Jeff, you and I will never comprehend. No. Look at this. <laughs> oh, I thought he was reaching to fire a second shell. Reaches for a time bank. He might. Is he going to do it or no? What do you think? Do you think he's studied or do you think he's not studied? I bet he's studied. He just doesn't even have like a, a blocker card in his hand. Just a couple of ducks and all the heart. All the heart. Oh my goodness. And he does reach for chips. Oh my goodness. Perhaps just trying to target what could be a hand like King Jack. Maybe King 10 suited. Queen 10, Queen Jack. Listen to all those hands he's rattling off. And obviously exactly Draws. Draws well that will bet if you fold Jack if you check. 10. It's worth noting, if you check the twos here and your opponent bets, you're folding, right? And your opponent can easily just bluff with draws on the turn if you check. Or if you check the turn and you check the river and they bet the river, you're still going to fold, right? So by checking this turn, you essentially just concede every time. But here, you're putting in 70 to try to win 210. If you win the pot a third of the time, you immediately profit, right? Peters. As long as Peter's hands doesn't contain an ace, this bet puts you in jail. It's not fun to be in jail. And you know what? Uh, Damo puts people in bad spots over and over and over and over and over. Actually be drawing stone dead. 
And uh, one thing I'll also say is that even though like Peters should probably call this against a lot of people, uh, the problem is like you know Adamo will follow through. He has proven to these players over and over and over again that when he bets the turn, that river bet's coming more often than not. It doesn't come every time. I play with him plenty of times where he checks and then gives up on the river. But if there's a player who will just load it in on you, it's him. And that forces the opponents to overfold here on the turn to the small bet because they see the overbet coming. Wow. I mean, it's not a fortunate spot. just got to fold. Don't use all your time, Banksy Peters. Could you ever raise it? He's probably considering a raise. Peters folds. Adamo gets it done again. <laughs> Adamo gets it done again. He's a crusher. We're running a little bit low on time. If you all want to go through one more hand, let me know in the chat box. And if you don't want to go through another hand, we don't have to. I'm going to tell you about the tournament masterclass we have. Look, I spent... Tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of time making this tournament masterclass for all of you. It's about 60 hours long, full of quizzes, full of content, and we cover all the common spots you are going to encounter at the poker table. Now, of course, there's going to be some very odd corner cases like that one we just looked at, right? That Adamo study that doesn't happen very often at all, but it does sometimes. But learning how to think about these spots is going to go a long way to helping you improve your skills. And at the end of this year, we're actually going to go back and add even more very, very advanced content featuring, uh, well, all sorts of fun stuff. So I'm not going to spoil that for you. But if you want to go ahead and get started studying the tournament masterclass, now is the time. This course is not for sale. You can only get access to it by signing up to Poker Coaching Premium at pokercoaching.com slash TMC. And our members are crushing it. Many of our members are out there grinding hard, winning bracelets. Here's Gershon that he won a bracelet last year. I showed this slide today of Gershon because he plays... And gives all the money he wins to charity. Doesn't really care about money. He's doing well off in life. He gives all of his money away to charity. And you know what I taught him to do? I taught him to play as close to a Damo as I possibly could. Essentially, get after it. Get in there, battle hard, and try to run people over. And you know what? He won a bracelet. He actually won it in a shootout tournament, which really incentivizes getting in there and battling hard because... Only first place gets any money. <laughs> and then whenever he got to the final table, he didn't really care about winning the, winning second or third or fourth place. He cared about winning the bracelet. And so he got in there, battled hard, and won the bracelet. So good job to Gershon. And, you know, we, we I do my best to teach my students to succeed, given whatever parameters they have. So you can get the tournament masterclass right now at pokercoaching.com slash TMC. You can sign up for one month, but if you buy two months, you get one free. You sign up for a long time, you get a lot of time free. I realize that poker coaching is, you know, a little bit pricey, but I want to do everything I can to make it as affordable as possible for all of you. And there is close to infinite content covering all the scenarios you will encounter. And if you ever have a question about any spot, send us an email, let us know it's not covered in the content we've already made, and we will make a course for you. We do it all the time. And, uh, well, we haven't done it a lot recently because we've covered almost all of the common spots you're going to encounter. We have tons of content from lots of world-class players that will help you take your game to the next level. So check it out at pokercoaching.com slash TMC. All right, let's go through one more hand because you all say you want to go through one more hand. Let's do it. If this will work. You going to work for me today? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Let's click refresh. Refresh always helps. And Adama with a 7-8 suited will stay interested, we presume. So I'm sure many of you watching now know this, but Adamo right there in the discussion for, for the very best player in the world, among the hottest players in the world right now. All right, here in this hand, we have Jake Schindler raising it up under the gun to 4,000. Adamo's in the big blind. Easy call with an 8-7 suited, I would presume. He did fine. Everybody at this table. You could three bet if you wanted to. If you look at GTO Solver in this spot, it three bets these medium suited connectors sometimes. Um, you three bet a little bit more linearly from out of position than in position, but I usually call against under the gun. Queen eight. 
Also, Jake's a little bit on the tight side. I mean, like, he plays like a GTO robot, but I think, if anything, he's, like, not so insane pre-flop, especially at a table like this full of all good regs. Lays claim to these sorts of things, and, and as we see, Ali, Adamo fancies this hand that this stacked up for a three bet. Notice again, we are playing 1,500, 300,000 deep, 200 big blinds deep, Raise under the gun. Adamo just, what is this? 7Xs it. <laughs> he pile drives him. He 7Xs it. That's nuts. I would have literally never done this. I mean, I just would have called every time. But I need to start taking these aggressive lines is what it amounts to. Obviously, the timing is bad. Schindler having the real deal. But how will Jake elect to respond to this three bet? A sizable 28,000. I think he calls here an awful lot, if not always. So some of you are saying, why not just re-raise the queens? Why not play back at him? Well, if you play back at him, he gets to fold all of his garbage. And obviously he's going to be doing this with aces and kings and queens and ace-king as well, right? Don't forget, Adamo gets to get good hands as well. I realize all these hands I'm showing you is uh, not such good hands. But he gets to have good hands too. And when he has good hands, he really sacks people. Remember that hand that he played against Negranu at the $300,000 buy-in tournament? He stacked Negranu like an hour into the day where he just did, did the classic classic Adamo, three bet, bet flop, bet turn, two X spot river. And uh, Negrandu called off with something. I don't remember what, like top pair, top pair, top kicker. Or maybe it was just ace high. I don't remember what it was. I actually thought it was a fine call against Adamo. And Adamo showed him the nuts. And uh, <laughs> Negrandu was just out. Oh, man. I didn't even mind Negrandu's play. Sometimes I run into it. Sometimes Adamo gets the nuts. When he gets the nuts, you're definitely going to pay him. That's actually a really big side benefit of playing this way, is that, yeah, you may end up punting off some stacks when your opponents just don't fold. You're going to have to re-enter a lot, get used to that, but you're going to get a hold of big chip stacks, and your opponents are going to pay you off like a slot machine that is rigged in your favor every single time you get the nuts. All right, anyway, Chandler calls. I think it's an easy call. You don't want to re-raise, because if you re-raise and get it all in, you actually don't love it. Oh. Onward. Accurately prophesized, and to the flop we go, a pesky over card, the king of hearts on the rainbow flop. A pair of sevens for Adamo. Nice, easy, small bet spot, I think, with a lot of Adamo's range. You see Schindler keeping a keen eye on, on Adamo to start things off. Sort of a nice flop for Mike, middle pair in the back door stuff. Well, let us defer to the Australian for sizing considerations. Looks like he's coming with third-ish. Easy call for queens. Don't fold queens. And again, like you got to realize, Schindler is in the mindset of try to get to showdown, please, as cheaply as possible. That's exactly what he is doing here. Nothing fancy. Try to get to the showdown. No four bet against Adamo. You don't want him to fold his garbage. That's what I think a lot of people don't realize. If you 4-bet and he puts his money in, it's not good for you. Believe it or not. <laughs> Eric Charles, hello, welcome, good morning. He's saying, click that like button. If you enjoy this show, by the way, click the like button, click the subscribe button, click all the buttons. That helps the robots in charge know that you enjoy this show. Easy call with the queens. Nothing, nothing else to do here. The 19K follow through. Gets called by Schindler. Hmm. Now, what a big turn card this is, Nick. All right. All right. All right. Should Adamo bluff this? Take a second. Think about it. Should Adamo bluff this? Again, whenever I'm watching these hands, I'm trying to figure out, like, what would Adamo do? Not necessarily what I would do or what GTO is. I'm trying to think what Adamo would do. I think this is not a particularly great hand to bet because if you bet and get jammed, it's awful. Now, again, will people jam you? Probably not so much. But, but I got to presume... I mean, look, if there's ever a hand to check and then check call, it is, this is a really nice hand to check and check call. So will Adamo do that or will he just like barrel through? <laughs> he enjoys barreling through. So a lot of you are saying so much equity. Yeah, so much equity to the point that you don't want to check and then, or you don't want to bet and then get jammed, right? That would be so bad. That would be so bad. This turn hits Schindler more? Uh, I don't know about that. I think this turn's pretty, pretty brickish. You got to think that Schindler's going to fold out Will he fold out 9-8 suited? Mm, maybe, maybe not. Would he fold sixes? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it actually does hit Schindler a little bit more. But, I mean, to be fair, Adamo has the 8-7, so obviously he could have the 9-8, right? 
you're saying bet two thirds. I really don't like two thirds because that really sets up your opponent to rip it on you. You so don't want to get shoved on here. Um, this comes up a lot when you're playing 40 big blinds deep in single race pots where very often the like ace high type draws don't actually bet because if you bet and get jammed, it's awful. It, it's a disaster to fold in a spot that's like roughly a break even call or like a slightly losing call. You would really not want to be in that spot. So in scenarios where you have showdown value, you usually end up checking. I know I've shown you only Adamo insane barrels, but uh, I think this is a check. I would check. Open ender. Get good at counting chips, by the way, if you're going to play live poker. Notice he just looked at his opponent's chips, confirmed however much it was. He figured it out in like half a second. It's not hard to do. It just takes practice. And the flush draw. I think it's a high frequency check sort of turn in general, but uh, as you said, Ali, it's a fantastic card for Adamo's actual hand. And you do get to put a lot of pressure on things like tens, jacks, and queens, which are quite real. He does go with the former. And in all likelihood, Jake will be content to check back. Although again, it is a pretty good card for Jake's range. In theory, he has these middle east sets, perhaps even some of the small two pair and straights. So sometimes you can leverage that to sort of put some chips in and gain some initiative. But black queens here, not the best. Easy check, check. King on the river. Seems like an easy check, check. You beat under pairs. You beat ace, queen. You beat ace, jack. Easy check. So look, I thought the turn spot was like, it was close. I thought it was close. Maybe maybe he's just going to blast them because that's what he does. <laughs> uh, King river is an obvious check, though. I mean, maybe you could go for a tiny bet, but I think it's a... Fine hand to check and then call most of the time. Maybe. Eh, I don't know if you can check and call. And the king pairing on the river actually may come as somewhat of a relief to Jake. Uncomplicating the texture. Yeah, I think this could go check bet. And we'll see how Adamo responds to that if this were to unfold. I don't really think we bet for value here, nor do we bluff if we're Adamo. We have quite a lot of showdown. Yeah. This might be one of those spots to go for like a 10,000 chip bet or a, a 3,000 chip bet. Kind of like that uh, Ace-5 earlier. Might be a spot to do that. And then if you get raised, remember that spot before? Remember that spot before? Again, you don't do it all, all the time, every time. But like right here, you block the straights. You block the full houses. Bet minimum if you get called, whatever, who cares? If you get raised rip it in but this is a little bit different of a spot though because if you get raised on this river what's your opponent likely to have well they're likely to have a king which is not going to fold so maybe it's not that spot you see how like these spots are similar but different right in that previous scenario the ace ace x would fold to the river would raise the river but then fold to the shove here if you bet tiny and get raised i gotta presume schindler is not going to raise with queens he's probably just going to call and take the easy way out i would take the easy way out I means maybe that's not actually gto slash ideal but I would take the easy way out. And um, then you don't get raised, right? But if you think Schindler's going to raise stuff like queens, jacks, tens, nines, and you can bet minimum, get raised, and then rip it on him, and they'll fold. So interesting spot that where you have to figure out how your opponent's range is going to be lined up with this spot and how they're going to play it. And I think for Jake, although it's scary-ish, especially against this guy who's just, you know, a true wrecking ball, I, I think we go for value on the strength of our kings and queens. I like the value bet here as well. I mean, you have the best hand almost every time. And you can get called by worse. Like if Adamo has jacks or tens or nines, right? And if you get raised, it's really bad. And normally you don't have to worry about getting raised because nobody check raises uh, with, that, with a bluff. Nobody, nobody except for Adamo. And Adamo will have a very awkward kind of decision. Something like 60%-ish seems to, to be... Definitely half potish in this spot, I think. Uh, you want to, again, we discussed this in the tournament masterclass. Look at the river section. Big bet size with the kings. Middle bet size with under pairs. Um, in position, you don't want to have a tiny bet size. Either like half pot and then pot. Given we're so deep, I don't think you want to have a rip it in range, although maybe you do. And then you can also mix in some like full houses with the tiny or the half pot bet size. That way you can easily call shoves. Plus bluffs. Ballpark. Let's see. Deep into the shot clock goes Schindler. 55. And he fires 55,000 right in that neighborhood. Half pot. Who'd have thought? 
Rather tricky to decipher. I suppose some of Schindler's flop floats, so to speak, would be bluffing turn. All right, now what is Adamo going to do? I mean, look, in this spot, when, he bet, when Schindler bets half pot, this is, this is actually starting to line up very similar to that ace-five hand, where Adamo has a hand that's kind of like a logical check-end call, right? But if you think about the value bets in the half pot size, I literally just told you what they were. It's going to be queens down to eights, maybe even ace seven, suited if he has it, and then a few full houses and then some bluffs. Are there any bluffs available? Would he ever have like queen jack of hearts or queen jack of spades or ace x of spades, stuff like that? Maybe, certainly maybe. So if that's the case, then you lose to the queens and jacks and tens and nines. It's one of these spots where Adamo just realizes I lose to all the value and most of the range is value. Therefore, I cannot call. So is this a good blocker bluff to shove because it blocks those full houses that will also bet small? And I just told you all, seven, sixes, and fives are probably the full houses that will bet small. Easy game. I don't know. Load it Let's up. defer to Mike here. Defer to Mike. It's kind of hard to find <laughs> bluffs, but we have a really good hand. Time bank. That's an overstatement, but <laughs> you know what I mean. And is he ever betting worse for value? I don't think so. So we sort of need him to be turning something like ace jack suited into a bluff. Perhaps ace queen, whether off or suited. We also need these to have not bluff turn. I don't think he's ever doing this with fours, threes, or deuces. I think these would be content to take the show down. Let's see. It's time bang time, Ali. I presume in these scenarios he's thinking about... Can't blame him. 151,000 and change in the middle. What What are the nuts in the opponent's range? And that's what you're thinking. What are the nuts in the opponent's range, Certainly would appear and how do I block it? The decision is between call or fold at this point and nothing further. <laughs> Who's that commentator? They're about to be embarrassed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> I may have spoken too soon, Nick. I don't think either of us anticipated this savagery. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> the guy is just... Uh, uh, did you see how Jake just kind of like shook his head? I, I have felt that way a few times playing these high rollers against these sickos. It's like, come on. Really clicking on all cylinders. Come on. Has a good hand for it. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, but... He blocks sevens full. He blocks eight, nine suited. Schindler's out of there. And uh, just Bluff bravo. you very much. Bluff you very much. Bluff you very much, everybody. Let's see. You get access to Matt Affleck's courses, or Matt Affleck's classes if you sign up to Poker Coaching Premium. Yes, you get access to everything at PokerCoaching.com. We have many, 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 many hours of content that get updated on a very regular basis. Again, we're having a sale on our Tournament Masterclass. If you want to learn how to analyze these river spots, like Adamo does, you still have to get a little bit of uh, fortitude and be willing to actually make the bluffs. But if you want to learn about these spots and be able to decipher these spots in game, we teach it all at the Tournament Masterclass. So make sure you get in it. This course has tons of content, tons of quizzes to be sure that you thoroughly understand all of the content discussed. It takes you from preflop all the way to the river. And... It teaches you what you need to know to succeed. So check it out right now at pokercoaching.com slash TMC. Get in there. Enjoy it. Learn a lot. And let me know how it goes. Adamo is way too good. Indeed, Adamo is very, very good. If you enjoy the content, click the like button. As 810 Poker says, Nick Cole says, hope I remember you and you enjoy the courses. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Would we value bet the A7 on the river for... That lowish pair? Probably not, because Adamo could easily have queens, right? So you probably don't want to bet a seven all the way down to that. I want to thank all of you for being here today. What is this, a poker school? This is a poker school. Are you aware you went to pokercoaching.com? Rampage is raging. He might lose 250K this week. Maybe. I just sat down with Rampage in Las Vegas, and we recorded a bunch of content together. It was a lot of fun. Rampage is a fun person. Funny enough, I actually played World Series of Poker bracelet events this summer, and in the first one, in the 7777 event, Rampage busted me. But then in the $5,000 buying tournament, I busted Rampage. So he's up 2500 on me, but call it even.
I'll sign for that. All right, that's going to be it for today. How to do the World Series? Mm -hmm. I think I had four caches, and I think I played about 15 tournaments. So 25-ish percent on that, not that you care about the caches. I had no deep runs. I took 12th place in a $10,000 buy-in tournament for 40-something thousand. I min cashed a $50,000 buy-in tournament. That's good. I'll tell you all the secret to success. Win in the big tournaments. <laughs> and don't worry about the little ones so much. This summer, I was pretty... Actually, I was actually unlucky online. I cashed two online tournaments, but they were both like $1,000 games, and I lost the $7,000 games. But in the live events, I cashed the 50K and a 10K. So won a bunch live. Lost a little bit online. Medium winner out the door. Call it a day. That's going to be it for today. If you want to learn how to succeed at tournament poker, please check out pokercoaching.com slash TMC. I would appreciate it. It's going to go a long way to helping you succeed. And that's what I'm doing here at the end of the day. I'm not in here making content for, for fun. I do it to try to help all of you enjoy poker more, win more from poker, and make the most of your opportunities. Also, if you don't play tournaments, well... We have a cash game masterclass, also thoroughly in-depth. It'll teach you everything you need to know to crush the game. So check it out at pokercoaching.com slash TMC. All of this is included. We have over a thousand interactive quizzes on poker coaching. We have weekly webinars with Matt Affleck, who studies hard, works hard, crushes the games. He's in there basically studying as he normally would study, except for he shares it with all of you. We have study sessions ran by some of our community members that are excellent. You need more Justin Sleba content. Ooh, if you want... More Justin Sleba content, the advanced tournament masterclass additional content that's coming out at the end of the year is going to include a lot of Justin Sleba content discussing ICM and uh, various final table scenarios and multi-way spots. So definitely check out that. Is Michael Acevedo still a coach for us? He is. I think him and him and uh, Giraffe Ganger, Big Crusher Online, just had a webinar a day or two ago where they go through one of their deep runs. They already always are having deep runs and they do joint webinars on a very regular basis. You enjoy Jonathan Jaffe content. We have a Jonathan Jaffe course coming out soon, soon. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, you just get it. You get all this stuff, but you just get all of it. You get all of it. I'm not trying to sell you some expensive thing every single month and get you to buy a course and a course and a course. It's just all included. It's all included. So anyway, check it out at pokercoaching.com slash TMC. That's me for today. Hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, click the like button, click the subscribe button, and more importantly, check out pokercoaching.com slash TMC and take your game to the next level. I'll be in Florida playing all the tournaments coming up next week. If you are at um, Seminole Hard Rock, feel free to say hello. They have a $5,000 buy-in tournament and a 10K and a 25K and a 50K. So we'll be in the action. We'll be, we'll be battling. It'll be a lot of fun. I'll talk to all of you next time. Thank you very much.